Hi, can you confirm if you can hear me? Yep, I'm clear. Okay. Just one sec. <laughs> Um, in that case, I will start my speech in three, two, one, go. What is the metric for judging this debate? I want to make it clear right from the beginning of Prime Minister. I think there are two things in, in a particular order. First is the happiness of this particular actor, uh, which is like how good you feel about yourself and how happy you're able to feel. Why do we think this is a justified metric? For a couple of reasons, right? First of all, psychological studies have just shown that levels of happiness tend to converge even if like you do really, really great things, which is to say you might achieve one thing, but soon, soon enough, your happiness levels do tend to converge. But the second thing I want to note is that, look, the marginal value of happiness always tends to diminish, which is to say, as you achieve successive levels of success, the marginal value of happiness that you get post each level tends to diminish, which is why there is no absolute value in getting the most amount of success anywhere possible. What matters most is how you feel about yourself, and that's the fairest metric. But the second thing I want to note is probably the good you're able to do to your own community, people you really like. Why is this a fair metric to judge this debate? A couple of reasons I want to note. First of all, insofar as you live within your community, you live with your relatives, family, etc., you are more proximate to them, hence you are an obligation to the people who are most proximate towards you and not people who are far away from you. This looks like not having an obligation towards probably any minority person ever on the planet or on the face of the earth, but people you actually know. But secondly, I want to note, insofar as you've projected your resources to your community and not people around you, you owe an obligation to the people you know most compared to other individuals. These two are probably the fairest metrics to judge this job. I also want to caveat that, look, the amount of good that you do in society isn't contingent on the level of good you do, which is to say you might donate 100 billion to charity, but if that doesn't make you feel good, it isn't great for this actor to begin with. Three things in my speech. First, what, what is the characterization of this actor? What is the actor's priorities and what should we care about? Secondly, why you're able to lead a net happier life on our side? Third, why are you able to do more good on our side, right? First on characterization, I want to note five pieces of characterization regarding how our world would look like. The first thing to note is that by, given by the context that insofar as you live a comfortable life, you probably have a stable job, which is to say you don't live under the constant fear of being retrenched or losing your job, and you have some level of insurance savings, etc. probably. Second thing to note is that you probably live in a community that doesn't outright discriminate you. This probably looks like you living within a community that is minority dominated or like just has some elements of majority, but they aren't like outright extremists to begin with. I'm not saying you don't know about the existence of discrimination, but that you don't face it on an everyday level. But the third thing I want to note is that you probably have good relations within your community insofar as you're a happy individual, which means you either have relations within your community or within your family, which are good and an active source of happiness for you. But the fourth thing I want to note, in the event in which discrimination does happen to you, similar events happen to people around you, your family or your community. This is why you're able to share a bond with them. So even if some discrimination rarely happens to you, the likelihood of which opposition has to prove to you, you are able to find a support structure within your group because people face similar discrimination and have similar lived experiences. The fifth thing I want to note is that you have a lot of options on our side because of your anonymity, which is to say, if you want to participate in a protest movement over the weekend, you want to volunteer for a minority charity over the weekend, you can probably do that without scrutiny because you live a life of anonymity on our side, right? The counterfactual and opposition is a world in which you have to prioritize your professional commitments a lot more. This looks like you're probably being a politician, a businessman, an actor probably, and you're having to give like, like, like I don't know, like six days a week for all your commitments, etc. You're not being able to spend a lot of time with your family because the demands of your job are so severe because you're a, you're a significant person and you have a lot of work to do. But thirdly, it also means that every action of yours has greater scrutiny by virtue of you being an influential figure, the likelihood of which I will prove to you later. Given this is true, two arguments then. First, why are you able to lead a happier life on our side? I just want to first look at the counterfactual and why the counterfactual is bad. I think the counterfactual is largely bad because like, it has increased scrutiny and hate speech upon this individual, right? I think the sources of these scrutiny and hate speech are twofold. First is within your community and second is outside of your community. Firstly, within your community, I think you're not going to be a liked or like loved figure for a few reasons. Three reasons to note here. The first thing to note is that in general, you're going. there's going to be general class resentment insofar as you were 
were the minority individual who made it big and so many other people didn't make it big there's going to be a general feeling of resentment even if you did put in some level of effort or hard work into becoming an influential figure i do i don't know why people are going to think of it that way because the general feeling is that ah this person made it i didn't it's a shitty life it sucks that's why you wouldn't be accepted within your community but the second thing i want to note is that there are higher expectations on you from within your community you are expected to be the ideal minority who is like you know hiring minority workers in your workforce is always like pro- performing liberal minority roles in like media etc because your community expects you to be as representative as possible and encompass as many voices as possible given that you are the person who has the opportunity and they don't and the the thing to note is that insofar as you have higher expectations op can't get away by prove that op has to necessarily prove to you that you satisfy those expectations because if you don't your community doesn't accept you but the third thing i want to note is that generationally it's bad for your family as well right insofar as you do anything for your children people will always see your children as the privileged black kid the privileged indian kid who doesn't know our lived experiences so insofar as you care about your family probably your, your children and your relatives probably lead a worse life because they're always seen as privileged individuals so this in itself wins us the debate because if the metric on op is that you should help your community etc we already win on that but the second thing i want to notice is this hate speech outside your community for three structural reasons firstly in so far as you're significant and you're influential journalists have a personal incentive to sensationalize everything which is they want to dig up dirt on you as much as possible because that's the best way in which they can get a promotion they can get more eyeballs etc the second thing to notice is that there are competing actor incentives in so far as you're an actor or in so far as you're a businessman competing businessmen or competing actors have an incentive to pull you down they always want to scrutinize you or they always find to find, find dirt against you but the third thing to notice is that like you there are probably competing fan base incentives in so far as like you always you're a polarizing figure right like some people like you some people don't in so far as that's true you get hate speech from a lot of corners on their side of the house things you can't deal with right before i get into the impact of this and why you lead a worse life on net poi is happiness the only thing that matters to someone yeah i think i i gave you sufficient justification of why that's the fairest metric right so yeah what is the impact of all of this right no opposition obviously can't get away by saying that your pr teams can obviously cover up with this because there's a limited amount of capital that they also hold like there's so much things you can't control amongst your fan, fan base which is why you will be subject to this but there are two impacts of this that are quite clear right first you always feel like you are not doing enough because no matter what you do you're always subject to more expectations you're always subject to more scrutiny which is why any marginal thing you do doesn't get you happiness but the second thing i want to note there is probably activism activism for tp which is even when you try doing things for your community your community doesn't accept you you're probably a divisive figure within your community which is why you feel a sense of activism for tp the third thing i want to note is as a result of all of this you just don't have enough time to spend with your loved ones right because every time you're just fending off allegations against you every time you just have to put in more hard work more graft etc because of which you don't lead a happier life if opposition wants to say you're able to do more good for your community i think that's untrue for a couple of reasons first in so far probably like if you're a political figure you probably have to cut deals with cronies you have to be, take bribes somewhere which are things that can be found out in your community probably won't like you probably secondly if you're a businessman or a worker you probably have to lay off some workers who have or of minority descent which means that like people are going to be mad against you which is to say your ability to do things within your control is severely limited on their side on our side you probably can go out and spend time with your family and like spend time with your loved ones which is exclusive only to our side for all those reasons we make this actor happy proud to propose We thank the Prime Minister for that speech. Now go on the clash of opposition. Hello, please. You're here. Senior Moro, uh, can you guys hear me? Ah, uh, yes, you're audible. Uh, I'll take POI in the chat, starting in three, starting in three, two, one. Panel, there are a lot of people in this world who may identify as happy, but obviously people are complex. You may identify as a happy person, but you still run into problems, and you still run into perhaps a more extent existential problem of not feeling fulfilled, of waking up every day and facing mundane problems and going through the same mundane routine and thinking it's all for nothing. I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about how first material how material wealth is going to be a huge part of this debate. Then I'm going to talk about how you have a greater capacity to express yourself, and then I'm going to talk about how you have a greater capacity to help others in a way that so that even if you're not happy, 
you're still going to feel more fulfilled. First, what's the incentives of this act? Obviously, they probably care about material wealth because who doesn't? We're you know, ingrained as human beings to care about material wealth. That's how we survived and evolved. Obviously, you care about hedonistic pleasure and you care about power. Secondly, you also care about your capacity to self-express. And thirdly, you care about your capacity to help others. Cool. First, your money and wealth. Firstly, obviously, when you're a public influential figure, you just have a fuck ton of money. You can sell to your audience merchandise. You can sell, you know, appearance fees and things like that. I think it's important to know because neither side can really tell you definitively what the preferences of this act is going to be, but we can definitively tell you that having a fuck ton of money means you can maximize any preference you want far more. What does that look like? Obviously, it means any hedonistic pleasure. It means if you want to go to some remote, like, place in the Himalayas and become a Buddhist monk, you could, and then you can change your mind and move back. You can just, there's just no opportunity cost ever because you can do whatever you want. I think hedonism will probably matter in spite you can just have intense pleasures day in, day out. They say you probably get used to it. There's a diminishing factor to it. Well, if you get used to something and feel unhappy because your benchmark, you don't improve upon a benchmark, well, then I think having less money means you're more likely going to feel unfulfilled and unhappy because you have greater, less capacity to introduce variability. That is to say, if you get bored in an area, now in our world, you have more capacity to move areas and eat new food and try new things. If it's about getting bored, you're less likely going to get bored on our house. Cool, on self-expression. So I would say as a powerful person, you have greater capacity to be subversive. So no, you could be a happy person, but you could also be someone who deep down wonders if I come out as gay, will I lose my job? If I come out as a certain way, will suddenly those friends that I have that I cherish so much see me in a different light and therefore that's the side of you that you're going to suppress. Note, if you're an influential public figure, firstly, you have a fan base that loves you. You probably have a fan base that loves you. So even if you're going to lose some relationship, you also have a greater people that are there to reinforce your, your confidence, to tell you that they do love you and stuff like that. Even if, you don't, even if your fan base is sexist, for example, you're more likely going to find a crowd that does love you. That is to say, if a famous person comes out and says that they're pansexual, even if their crowd turns on them, the pansexual crowd or the progressive crowd is probably going to embrace them because they probably want to leverage their fame to advance their own political aim. It means your capacity to find a crowd and to find a friendship is far greater, which means your, your confidence in being able to express yourself also goes up. Additionally, you're just able to move to a progressive area. So if you're a happy black person in the deep south, you're just easier to just move to an area that's more progressive and more accepting of your identity. The impact of that is you don't have to deal with the internalized shame, the fear of being caught, that little niggling doubt. You might identify the happy person, but it's still something that's going to slightly eat away at you as you suppress a part of you that you'd rather have out. Cool. How do we help others? Now, their big push on this was you're more like you're going to feel less happy in this respect because it's going to be greater expectation and capacity to help others. You're going to feel disconnected from others in your community, like your kid. And yeah, so and your stuff like that. I would say note, right? Obviously, like that can happen in their world too. It's like if you're a middle class black person, right? People in the hood are probably going to resent you in a similar way. But I think we mitigate that far more in our world. And I'm going to tell you why. First, your ability to help people in your close proximity. You can just do it to a greater extent and you can do it for more people. That means instead of just buying your parents a nice place in a retirement village, you can buy them a fucking mansion. Instead of like buying your kids like a nice, you know, moving to a nice public school, you can give them the best private school ever. You can set them up for why. In scale and in breadth, we, we dominate them on that capacity. Given that they say helping those in your proximity makes you happy, then you obviously make you more happy when you can do it far more. It means you get that release of love that you just help someone that you love. It almost means you get that less stress. In their world, you may be happy with your life right now, but just something that you've always got to consider that maybe I lose my job and that's going to be a bit of a tough thing. That's always so that's why you have that constraint on your behavior because you need that comfortable job. You need that comfortable life. Otherwise, you have nothing. In your world, you can literally do anything. You can give anything to your family. No matter what happens to your family members, you can be there. If they get sick, you can fund the most, the best doctors and things like that for them. So you can help your those in your proximity far more, right? You can meet those expectations, etc. Thirdly, how you help those in your broader community. I think a big part of why people feel pain is because they get constantly reminded that they are helpless to their circumstances. They see the hood that they grew up in constant like you deal with abject poverty or they see on the news someone with their skin color get shot by the police and they can't do anything they feel helpless in the face of it in our world at least now you have the capacity to do so now you can fund the lawsuit of that person you saw on the news when they go to person they go to sue the police to get justice for that now you can like build schools you can build things for your community you can build things for your community far and wide you can go to you know what I mean? Like your home place in Asia or something and build a community and help build the community there. You can literally do anything you want to help people. 
to feel like your life matters, to feel like the mundanity and the routine of your life has some meaning beyond your death in a way you can transcend your death, transcend the mortality that we all face because now you leave a legacy. Now you leave happiness. Now you leave something in the minds of others that's going to carry on, that's going to carry on for generations. In their world, even if you're happy, in the end, it all means nothing because they're going to be dust and the impact and you know, the point at which people forget about them, then their life no longer matters. Cool. So I think even if you're unhappy, that is an incredibly deep like way to feel fulfilled. Note, parent, priest, revolutionary, time and time again, people are more than happy to give up their happiness, more than happy to give up material consideration for fulfillment, to feel like they're part of something greater than themselves, to feel like that they, their, their life matters in a way that's beyond the fleeting nature of existence on, on, on planet Earth, right? I think even if you're slightly unhappy because of privacy and things like that, in the I've told you about subversive powers, right? At the very least, you can know your life mattered. You can know that when all is said and done, you had an impact beyond your little speck of your little speck in the universe, right? So why do we win this debate? We win because we win on every single metric. Your capacity to access happiness is far greater when you just have money and you just have people that love you to a greater extent. And additionally, even if happiness is like fleeting or whatever, we get deep fulfillment. We get the knowledge that your life mattered and that you help those great or help the cause greater than yourself. We're very proud to oppose. I think Ella for can you just wait for 30 seconds? I'm just gonna run to the bathroom. I'm really sorry. Yes, no worries. Let's just take like a minute for everyone to get some water as well. Um, how much longer are we waiting for? We're just waiting for one of the panelists to get back. Yeah, Maybe okay. around 30 seconds. Cool. I'm back. We can stop. All this being said, yellow whenever you're ready. Anakin asked an interesting question in this debate. What does it mean to be fulfilled? Because humans don't want to be just happy, we want to be satisfied. There's a difference between say, the happiness that I achieve when I eat a chocolate cake, and the satisfaction that I achieve after a long day at the gym where I know I worked hard. And yes, getting to that satisfaction was difficult, but I will always take that satisfaction over any amount of guaranteed pleasure that I may have over just the consumption of chocolate cake. And I think that that just proves the point that we are trying to make to you here today. But what we claim on our side is that yes, your life may have difficulties, that yes, it won't be easy to achieve all the changes that you want to achieve. That yes, maybe some people will scorn you. Maybe some people will look down on you. But at the end of the day, when you cross into the great beyond, I think that on our side, you will have felt that you lived a more fulfilling life. You will have felt that you lived a more satisfied life. And as a result, you have preferred the life that you had just lived compared to one where you die in obscurity. 
Why is it important that you understand the distinction between simply constantly seeking serotonin in the brain and understanding what it means to seek fulfillment? Because it means that the minimization of struggle does not win them any points in this debate. Because it means that one side of government tells you that, ah, this is going to be very difficult. Some people will shame you. You're going to need to be careful about the way that you present. It's not going to be easy when you try and get change enacted within society. It doesn't really matter because it wouldn't be fulfilling. It wouldn't be satisfying if we just lived our lives just constantly like sheep, enjoying the middle class lifestyle and falling into obscurity. Because we, as all of us know, sitting in our rooms, watching debaters go, want to be more than that. We don't want to be people who just lie there and die and be forgotten. We want to be people who have achieved something, done something meaningful with our lives. And the definition for that has to be struggle, right? Because if you achieve something too easily, you don't feel fulfilled as a result of achieving that. If you just get given something as a reward, you don't feel like that you earned it in the same way that you had to save up your pocket money and like actually go mow lawns or whatever it is to be able to achieve that thing. We tell you that we give you satisfaction on our side, and that is why we will win. So then let's ask the question, how do we maximize fulfillment such that our people are able to achieve more spiritual enlightenment? I'll take POIs via chat because I forgot to mention that. The first thing that we tell you is we achieve satisfaction by making sure we maximize your ability to do meaningful things. And we think that obviously what meaningful things mean for everybody is going to be different, right? For example, what's meaningful to me is going to be winning worlds and it's not going to be meaningful to a footballer, but we have things that we think are gen as a general rule, minority groups will care about and individual parts of minorities will find meaningful. And what that first thing is, is as they themselves claim to us, helping and aiding your family. But the important thing that we tell you on our side is we maximize your ability to achieve that satisfaction, right? Because on their side of the house, you only achieve a pale imitation of what we're able to provide you. Because first of all, on, your, on their side of the house, if something goes disastrously wrong, you probably can't save your father's life. Because if your father has like some extreme rare form of cancer and he needs millions of dollars for an experimental treatment, you can't save them. It means that if your uncles fall sick, maybe you have enough money on your middle class income to support one uncle, but you probably also can't support their entire family if he dies. It means that maybe you can support your generic direct family, but you won't ever be able to help that auntie across the street who gave you cookies when you grew up and helped you raise you to be the person that you want to be. We say that if you want to achieve something meaningful meaningful for the people around you, then obviously the way to go is to get as much wealth and as much like money as possible and influence as possible so as to be able to protect them. And we say that if you ask someone, would you rather go through a little bit of sacrifice so that everybody around you who helped raise you to be who you are lives much, much severely lives and note the word everyone, that's the amount of wealth you get when you have a public uh, uh, um, figure versus just the people who you can and then you start ignoring or justifying to yourself about why you can't you help your uncle? I think it hurts you whenever you say, oh, well, look, I'd really like to help you, but we, we, are, we can only afford, you know, tuition for my children. I've got to make sure my parents go to the retirement home. I think that's a stab in your otherwise happy heart. I think you feel less fulfilled as a result of your life because you have to keep constantly abandoning members and justifying why they are no longer part of someone you all care about. But the second reason that we tell you we seek fulfillment is that as a minority, obviously you've lived a life under repression and that similar oppression that you see on a day-by-day -day basis hurts you and hurts you like in a soul-based level, right? We tell you that continues on a day-by-day -day basis. You go to your work, you may live a personally happy life, but when you see that yet another person has been killed unjustly by police, when you see that yet another person has been discriminated against just because they choose to like present as a different gender than they are like biologically, we say that hurts you, right? We say that having lived through those very similar experiences yourselves, you feel empathy for them. You feel like that if you could do something for them, you probably would, which means that obviously if you can and you can choose to live in a world where you are able to have the ability to help them, even if it just means being able to raise attention, even if it just means that your voices matter more when people listen to, and people will listen to you more, then you probably feel more satisfied and live happier and less guilt-free for your life if you choose to take the option where you choose to help each other. It's not enough to just say, ah, if we live a somewhat comfortable life and eat chocolate cake all the time, that's enough to achieve happiness. You must aim for something greater. I'll take a POI if you have one. Yeah, obviously you don't guarantee satisfaction on your side. Given that's the case, where is your ability to speak out if you're not satisfied more? When you have so much wealth and you're still depressed or when you don't have a lot of wealth but you can still talk about it to your family?
I mean, I just told you, if we could guarantee you anything, then you wouldn't, by definition, get satisfied from it, right? It is the fact that it is a challenge. It is the fact that you will achieve minor victories in the pathway. It is the fact that even if you don't ever manage to completely stop police shootings, you do something tangible. You can start up a charity. You can raise part of a protest. You can raise your voice so that many, many more people hear it. And rather than just being one inconsequential voice in the crowd, that means that you can do something tangible and feel fulfilled as a result of it. But the final thing that they do no response to is that they do not do anything about their own metrics. That we tell you just even if you understand happiness to be chocolate cake, but we still get you much more of it, right? Because we are going to maximize your ability to express yourself hedonistically, but also we maximize your ability to be you. Because we tell you that it's inherently soul drained to have to hide your identity or like, you know, pretend you're not gay when you go to work or, you know, make sure that you live in the right community so that you don't get discriminated against. All of that is exhausting. We we say having money and having influence is what allows you to break free of that rat race and actually express yourself. We are so proud to oppose. We thank the deal for that speech and I'll go on with a bit of the government. Here, here. Cool. Um, starting. And um, I'm so sorry to ask this, but would it be okay for people to turn off their camera only because I have kind of bad internet? Thank you so much. Cool. Cool. Um, starting in three, two. One, two layers of preemptive mechanism on why we win this debate on a happiness metric. Firstly, I think happiness is the only measurable value for this individual who is a minority, particularly because they will never have epistemic access to being part of something larger because you don't know how other people are perceiving your material wealth or your donations. You will just simply never know the way in which other people are reacting to you. And therefore, the only thing that you will ever actually have information about is the way in which you feel about yourself, which is particularly happiness in this debate. But I think the second thing that's true is that because this is an actor motion, we also need to consider agent-specific needs. I think happiness is the only thing that can be compared pretty evidently towards other people, which means that people are more likely to be, like this minority individual is more likely to be socially influenced by people that exist around them into believing that happiness is important. This is uh, this is particularly true because happiness is just a lot more accessible to be compared than self-fulfillment. Because self-fulfillment in itself is probably a super elite idea. Not, not a lot of minorities care about like fulfilling their like existence in this earth. They probably care about having a good existence and a happy existence in this earth. Uh, I think this claim is valuable because it is reductive for opposition to say that the only way in which you will ever be truly like have a valuable existence is if you have struggled, because I think that minority communities have struggled by virtue of being minorities. So insofar as we're able to co-opt that benefit, we've also told you why happiness is a reason why we should win that win above them in this debate. I'm going to answer one large question in this speech. What is the extent of help you can do and what good does that do to you as an actor? I have three layers of way, uh, the ways in which I'm going to do it. Um, DLO, are you still there? Oh, sorry, top web. Uh, yeah, we'll just check upon her. I think her internet got disconnected. Okay, no worries. I paused their time. Uh, can I know what time you paused it on? Just so I can keep track of my phone too. All right, it's around 1 minute 40 seconds. All right, solid.
Yeah, her internet got disconnected. She's just joining back. Oh, no worries. Hi, um, I'm so sorry. Uh, could someone tell me where I got cut off? I had a power cut at home and the internet went off. Hi, right, so um, the panel paused their timer at around 1.40. And you were last heard talking about like imperatives of how happiness as a metric is like analyzed in like different levels. Um, cool. Uh, OK. Um, Give me one second. <laughs> cool. Starting um, in, wait, if I finished at 140, how much time do I have left? Okay, cool, got it. Um, yeah, got it. <laughs> Starting in three, two, One, I think it is then reductive for opposition in this debate to say struggle is valuable because I think that minority communities have already struggled enough, which means insofar as we co-op that benefit, we also show you why happiness is valuable. I'm going to answer one large question in this debate, which is what is the extent of health you can do? And I'm going to do this in three ways. The first is to contest the ability to spend this money without scrutiny like opposition would want you to. I think this is true for three layers of analysis. Firstly, that like most of this spending is going to be viewed as performative by your own community, which is a valuable claim you've heard in Ishan Sriram get, that gets no response from opposition in this debate. But I think the second thing that's true is that you're often going to have to pick and choose your battles, which means you're going to be advised against calling out the police and doing all of the good things that opposition wants you to, because you're, like, your PR agencies or you in general are likely to know you're going to lose those battles. Insofar as that's true, I think the backlash of putting up with representation, uh, uh, with putting up your reputation behind a losing side is more likely to be true on our side of the house, which means that it's generally bad for the actor. I think the third reason why this is true is that there's competing actor incentives and competing majority incentives to blow up every single singular wrong you do. This looks like Sam Smith being called out for saying that they were the first openly gay person um, that was to win a Grammy, et cetera, which means that more likely that all of the good you do is going to be erased by one singular bad you do because people have a tendency to remember the bad over the good. This analysis, I mean, this rebuttal is valuable for two reasons. I think one, it shows you that literally none of the good you can, the opposition wants to do can ever materialize, but two, it shows you that the people you want to help are unlikely to ever trust you insofar as these minority communities think you're so different from them you have absolutely no similar lived experiences to them i think this washes that claim of being part of something larger because presumably what you would want to be part of something larger is your own community not general altruism and insofar as opposition gives you no reason to believe otherwise take this over them we have to super simple i think perceived the imperatives to movements, perceived imperatives to com communities, etc., will all always supersede the actual efficacy of your donations. And insofar as that's true, you will always believe that you aren't doing enough. This people will expect you to do more. You will never truly then be satisfied with the life that you're currently living. The second thing I want to do, though, is contest that having enough money and manufacture happiness in and of itself. I think this is true uh, for two reasons. I think the first reason is 
of whites too, is because you're a minority community, you're often going to have to give up large amounts of money that you could normally accrue, which is endorsing brands, endorsing corporates, etc. that are shitty towards minorities because you already, as opposition concedes, have an obligation towards your community. In, insofar as that's true, you will probably not be able to get a lot of like the revenue that you could get on, uh, like, uh, on uh, their side of the house. I think the second thing that's true is that less people are just willing to platform you insofar as there probably exists competing majority influential figures that have larger reaches, you're unlikely to get the media time that they want you to accrue. I think this claim is valuable for two reasons, right? One, it undercuts that claim of material wealth, for example, buying your parents' mansions, etc. Because one, they never show you why have, you have enough money to do that. But two, I don't know why this matters to you more than your own happiness of spending time with them, of having emotional connections, etc. The second reason why this is valuable, though, is it shows you that self-fulfillment is satisfied by the conditions you're in. On their side of the house, you're always going to engage in a hedonistic treadmill where you're going to walk, continuously want more, whereas for us, it's easier to satisfy yourself because you have like limited means of doing that satisfaction. The way up is simple. I think you just matter more to yourself more than anybody else in doing good to the community as a whole because, one, you have a primary relationship with yourself and you have proximate value by virtue of that relationship, which means your obligation to yourself is obviously going to be higher. Which means you have some information on what you want, which means you are most likely to be able to affect some change on our side of the house versus some unlikely change because you don't know how everybody around you feels on their side of the house. The third thing I want to contest, though, is um, wait, I'll take a few. There's one before that. Let me of gay icon. No, obviously, no one drinks. Is it being necessarily um, true? There are two people talking. Not a good shot. Or there. of gay icons exist. Is it necessarily true that being gay and a minority may, and rich means that people hate you? I think that is because one, a lot of these people are like part of a community that genuinely has super lived, like different lived experiences. They're often being oppressed, they're often being discriminated against. And when you see a public figure that is doing the best, like that at least shows that they're having the best life that they can possibly can, I think a lot of people are just going to be upset about the ways in which you're diverting from your own community. The third claim I want to make though is even if you get a lot of money, let's concede that you do, you can't end oppression. I think this is two for three like uh, rebuttals, right? One, you're unlikely to, it is unlikely to ever make you feel good because you will never feel like you're doing enough because you will never, it'll never be restricted to helping your own dying aunts and uncles more people will seek you out and then you will always feel overburdened because you just genuinely can't help every single person that wants to seek you out because you are publicly influential and therefore a lot more people have access to you but i think the second thing that's true is that a counterfactual which has been super clear in sriram and isha's speech for you that you're happy and comfortable you're probably comfortable insofar as you own the minority tag which means you undercut a lot of the harms of like being scared about what will happen if you're, you're called out as gay Last thing I want to do, though, is to show you why this argument is valuable, because it shows you that grief is inevitable on both sides of the house. Insofar as you're able to prolong somebody's surgery, etc., like your dad's surgery, they're probably, they're probably going to die on both sides of the house, and we would prefer that they die when a situation where you're not estranged from the community, you're able to get some support from them. Insofar as that's true, we win. So happy it was. Thank you, Gavrik. We now go on the last of right. the whole opposition, opposition. Okay. Audible. Yep, audible. All right. Uh, so I actually prefer if people could just turn on their cameras. I like having fun. Uh, I mean, like, not, not to say, you know, just, just turn on your cameras, please. Uh, also, Ernest, I see you're here, Ernest, and I recognize that you are not judging, so I can say this and I can talk to you directly. If you turn on your camera, I have an entire page dedicated to Malaysian jokes that I think are pretty funny. It'd be great if you could laugh with me, you know? There we go, my matcha. <laughs> Hi. Anybody else, judges, people? Ah. Nice. Uh, I hate this. I love you, Hamas. I love PYs, interrupt me. The more you harass me, the more you remind me of home. Uh, and I don't know, see Yeet or something. The funner you are, the more likely I am to take a PY. If you make me last, I may take two. <sighs> I think Zaid Guff answers the question, the fundamental question of this debate really well. Fantastic fallacies and where to find them. It is literally littered all across their speeches. A couple of things that we're going to do in this debate. The first thing to do is let's talk about what came up from a quick and the shifting of mechanics towards what we can feasibly do. The first thing they say is that, ah, we need to then prove why this individual has a lot of money to move forward. This is like nitty gritty rebuttals, right? We need to prove that this individual has a lot of money and has to be able to move forward. I think that's a debate and comparative, right? And it's set up in PM. It means if you say that your side defends a 
average reasonable person who is middle class, it is reasonably for me to assume that the competitive debate is this fucker is a bit rich, got some money going on there, and living a pretty fucking great life. Now, here's how we're going to win this debate. We're going to take this on two metrics. Their only path to victory is the idea that some level of fulfillment or some level of happiness is something that is non mutually exclusive. We're going to eradicate this. We're going to do two things. The first thing we're going to do is going to show you why happiness on a scale is something that's better. The second thing we're going to do is going to show you why benefiting the community is something that is just fucking easy with money. But before that, can we just do some like basic nitty gritty intuition bumps? Now, a lot of things that they want to do in terms of responses and the first fallacy they buy into is they say, ah, well, in the status quo, there are a lot of harms towards the minority community. For example, there's expectations that are placed upon you. There's regret that is placed upon you. There's the fear that you're not good enough, yada, yada, yada. And all these things exist on a scale on side of on side opposition's world, and therefore it's bad. There is a fallacy. What do you think happens in Indian households or outside house? You think I come home with a B, people love me particularly? You think if I bring my boyfriend home, they're going to be very accepting of these things? You think that if I come back and have disappointments or expectations, it is something that is not mutually exclusive? I think they try to take away human experiences altogether and say that this is not my burden, right? Three days of responses. The first is everything that they talk about in terms of pretense. You can look at your notes, you can litter all the way under expectations, regrets, you're talking about money, and maybe you're not good enough, maybe Amma Appa didn't give you enough ladu. Like, I don't care. All these things are things that happen regardless on the on your side of the house, too. That means the level of harm is something that is non mutually exclusive. Three layers of comparative to why we've been this. No responses. The first thing we hear coming out from Hamez's speech is the idea of fulfillment. We hear this in Darius' speech, too. Today is a scale. I think what you need to recognize here is that they say, ah, well, you go through suffering and therefore it's not mutually exclusive. The first intuition pump, come on, I have to go to my household data and deal with my fucking uncle that's annoying and thinks that I'm gay, versus I get to fuck my boyfriend a yacht and I see, for example, some hate messages on Twitter. Scale which one you feel more happiness in, just intuition, right? The ability to buy wealth means that you can buy fucking great things. You can choose what you want to do. All these things are better, but more importantly, you go through more struggles, you pick your fights, you're able to fix your fights, you're able to win, it is better, you don't feel helpless, you don't feel hopeless, you're, not, you're no longer biased. And the scale argumentation is also relative. It means because you don't have this set of experiences on the outside of the house, you feel the same level of pain that you have to, but you can't opt out of this. You're only dependent on family. You are stuck within those communities and so on. Your jealousy argumentation is non mutually exclusive. Communities are poor. Communities are afraid. And all these things means if you're a middle class person who can go a couple of months off, they're still as jealous as you. They're still going to hate you for your wealth. They're still going to hate you for your class. They're still going to hate you for your success. And they're still going to tell you you're not doing enough. You could do more. You could be better. But you will know that you can and you could not have done anything about this, right? Because the reason why you failed is because you did not get that A. You did not go to med school. You did not achieve all these type of things. And all these things are a harm that exists comparatively. The second thing they then say is that, ah, well, there's an ability to complete it that is important that we need to prove. I say, fuck the indicting, huh? Our bare bone burden is, you got a lot of money. You see a Twitter account saying, I need, pump, I need someone to pump in money for my legal fees. You give the money to the account. Unless bank transfers are really fucking difficult, I say that is a scale that an individual can buy into. But you can also do it multiple times. It means even if it succeeds or doesn't succeed a couple of times, you know you did literally everything you can. But more importantly, everything you can is fucking good enough in comparison to some Gotong Royong shit. That was a joke, Ernest. In comparison to some Gotong Royong shit that you do on said government, who cares if I go, for example, to a school club or I pick up trash on the side of the road? And then they say, ah, well, at least you feel happiness from this. Do you know what minority communities go through? If I go through police brutality, I don't go, well, at least my brother is sitting right next to me, much are going for it, right? Absolutely fucking not. The yeah, fact I... is, in the majority of cases, I suffer and I feel a lot of pain and I feel helpless. There is no alternative for me to move forward. Fun POS, give me a gift or something. But no, the next thing they're going to do is, other than that, look at these argumentations and how it flows. The first thing we tell you is that one, the satisfaction is not mutual. The harms that they want to push is not mutual exclusive. Two, we tell you on a scale, they're relatively worse because you're solely dependent on parents. Three, fulfillment is something that's comparatively better because A, we're able to do more, A and B, we're able to complete it. C, we tell you that the ability to complete it means less regret, but more importantly, less regret because you know you've done literally everything you can and there's an inability to do these things. But four, fuck it all, right? Let's just say you're paralyzed by choice, like what the DPA wants to say, because endless options can be bad. Give away all the fucking money. They just throw it away. Go to your pretty little yard, just fling it off the side of the road. You take away all your options. The basic idea here is when you are rich, you can do anything you fucking want, right? You can choose to give away options. You can choose to take options. You can fuck up. You can pull a tea swizzle. You can go to New York and find yourself within the woods, but you can't do that on your side of the house because you are forced to forever live harmful narratives. By the way, I love the laughing my room. You can just continue doing it, right? Oh, yeah. Someone got beer for me. No one had anything fun. Come on. Hit me. You could have more money, but why are you likely to have enough to manufacture happiness to cover up the lack of emotional connection that you most definitely will have on our side of the house? 
I don't understand why there's a lack of emotional connection, right? For example, I grew up with a mom and dad. For example, if I'm rich, why can't I have the same level of emotional happiness and same level of community building that you have? Why does it mean that I don't have a family members? It's only I'm an orphan. Why does it mean I can't have meaningful experiences? Why does it mean I can't have friends and circumstances that are available? Why does it mean that I can't build communities? But even if it does, you are fucking famous. Go and buy yourself a prostitute. Go and buy yourself happiness. Buy yourself friends. Like all these things mean you can literally get everything you want. What do you get on your side of the house? If you're an ugly person or a fat person, you die alone, right? You can't fear that everybody's going to be able to have sex and live happy lives on your side of the house, right? Notice what the comparative then exists, huh? A, inability to obtain fulfillment, we tell you that money allows you to buy into a lot of different things. B, inability to obtain fulfillment in terms of satisfaction, we tell you there is a scale of experiences that you will never be able to experience, but also we are able to fulfill that. In the scale of experience when it comes to regret, we tell you it's non mutually exclusive and human experiences are worse when it's solely dependent on one family, one circumstance, one community who still hate you and still think you're jealous and all these other things. The last thing you will then say is let's talk about community building and why do we get that better on our side house? Because you are bigger, you can do more things. Your anonymity argumentations of people don't hit you is also a non-mission exclusive, but B, it means that we can buy into the benefits of having a big community, right? If you want to opt out, create safe spaces, buy into particular Twitter accounts, we do that in status quo. There are people who are loved, but more importantly, they are not charitable at all. We are giving them every fucking thing. You cannot tell us that rich people aren't sometimes happy and then do that debate on where you weigh it out, right? The last thing that we tell you is because you can give out more, more people want to come to you and talk to you to get meaningful experiences from you, right? You're wealthy, they get exposure, yada, yada, yada. You get to choose all these type of things. The entire thing we tell you, other than just all this, you get to express identities. You don't have to go to your weird uncle's house and tell them, no, uncle, she's just my nice friend. I can actually go out and say that, hey, I'm gay. I can pick two communities that I want to participate in. I can express my identity. I can buy shit. Look up. The only way they win is if you think your family dinners where you sit around the table and talk about how shitty school is, is the same as going on a yacht and fucking and thinking, fucking your partners and telling you that that is the same level of happiness that exists. Never proud of the polls. We thank the speaker for that speech. You now go on with the reply speeches. I'll reply, please. You're here. I mean, the theme of the last couple of people is just cameras on or off. So surely I've got to be like, 50% of you have to have your cameras on, 50% of you have to have them off, and then like, uh... <laughs> all right, let's just get started. Three, two, one, go. The theme of this debate is essentially that of the matrix, red pill or blue pill, boring, same, like generic happiness, or actually trying something risky and feeling fulfillment as a result of it. The first question that we must ask ourselves, though, is how guaranteed do you feel like their side has been able to provide for you the amount of happiness that you will get? But the first thing that they told you is you're obviously going to get more emotional fulfillment. But Rosie challenges that quite succinctly, because why is it necessarily true? Why is it mechanistically true? But just because you are also like wealthy and successful, that you automatically have no time to be able to do any of the things that you want. Surely an abundance of time and an abundance of money was the only thing that mattered. The second thing that they told you though, in terms of emotions, is that they never really managed a question. Like, yeah, sometimes you may have a personally happy life, but the community around you is still shit and still treats you badly. So why is it necessarily true that maybe you have a middle-class lifestyle and you're somewhat rich and wealthy in comparison, but all the people still hate gay people around you, you still have to hide that, never managed to quite answer that, which means I don't think that like, although you do have some level of like happiness via just the generic normalcy of happiness, I don't think they're able to guarantee you much more emotional bonds we were better able to provide you those emotional bonds at the point where you had the money to be able to pursue them and had the ability and influence to be able to get them but second they questioned the guarantee of your ability to get happiness by the way of like challenging your like ability to have like good communities in the first place and we think said that we told you that we needed some ability to provide for our families it was best that we maximize that we told you that therefore what that results in is it's unreally clear what unique benefit they get on their side in terms of the generic plain chocolate cake happiness that we get but where we clearly win this debate and where I think they just do nothing at all in terms of meaningful response with is being able to raise your idea that it isn't just sort of like having serotonin in your brain that matters. It isn't just having short-term pleasures and fulfilling a lack of like a, 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 a lack of abuse and having like comfort that matters. But to a human, there are bigger things than that. That to especially a minority group, that it mattered that you are able to have achievements such as the ability to help all the people that you saw in the newspaper that like, you know, you felt bad about was you were part of that minority and yet empathy towards them and you had the ability to maximize your ability to help you and your parents we told you that you achieved more fulfillment 
So why were they not able to get ahead on this? The first thing is they tried to undercut our feeling of achievement by making a weird epistemic access argument, to which the obvious response that Rosie gave to you was that, yeah, bank transfers exist and you could just give money to your uncles, and also that it seems barely obvious and it's not necessarily true. Like, no point in any of our speeches were we defending that the only action you could do was that you could, like, give money to charities. We were constantly giving examples, like you tweeting out on Twitter. We think that that sufficiently proves that you probably had plenty of epistemic access. We think that that analysis by itself wasn't able to win them that round. Ergo, what was left was that I had to deal with all of our analysis about what felt more to you, more than just happiness when you overcame all of the struggles that it took for you to even try to be able to achieve some extra level of uh, meaning and fulfillment. And that that meant, as I pointed out in my own speech, was that all of their analysis then about jealousy, all of their analysis then about the fact that you won't succeed, all of their analysis about like, you know, other people trying to tear you down, that doesn't really matter, right? Because we flipped that argumentation. We told you it was exactly those things that meant that when you were able to do great and amazing things, you felt really proud of it. That meant that you were able to feel greater than happiness levels of enjoyment and fulfillment and satisfaction as a result of your life. But the final thing that we just sort of really, really, really needed an answer to was how could you possibly fulfill your obligation to everybody that you wanted to fill an obligation to in this debate? right? Because we told you that as a minority, you wanted to maximize your ability to help and they note themselves, the people close to you, we told you on their side of the house, you have to make sacrifices. You couldn't help everybody. On our side, we can help everybody and we get the fuck on yachts. I think we just clearly win. And with that, the close off opposition going on the last feature of open semis. Here, here. Hi, can you confirm if I'm audible? Yep, you're audible. Cool, cool. Okay. Um, starting my speech in three, two, one, go. Look, I think the best part about that op whip was that it was funny, but there are glaring loopholes in that op case, which just go unresponded to, right? From all three speeches, we've asked you questions to which we have absolutely no response to, but I'm going to tell you why there are probably a couple of reasons why you can give them the debate and tell you why both of them don't make sense, right? The first reason why you might want to give up the debate is that material world gives you more optionality and obviously you can just throw money off a yard, right? Look, the problem is this, there is a fundamental case contradiction amongst them, right? Because their case in one line is that privilege Privileged people somehow struggle more because of which privileged people will feel more satisfied, whereas on our side, people are eating more chocolate cake. Like it just doesn't make sense to me. Like this smart happiness versus satisfaction binary that they try to draw is at best false. If anything, I would say that you struggle more on our side. So on their very metric of like struggle, we probably win. But let's see what their material wealth argument really is, right? Because they say like a couple of things here. But the, the problem with their material wealth argument is that it's not material wealth that gives you the ability to be happy, but it's the ability to exercise material wealth that give, gives you the ability to be happy. The problem with them then is that they never respond to the constraints that we give you right from like first and second, which is to say, yes, you have money, but your constraints on using that money are the fact that like first, you in get increased hate speech and scrutiny to the point which you're seen as that privileged person throwing money off a yash. But secondly, there are also higher expectations upon you to give to charity, to be that person who does everything and doesn't blow away their money, which means there are tangible constraints that they never respond to. And also like the op whip comparative is like the most skewed in the round ever like their comparative can only work on of like fucking your boyfriend on your rush can only work if you're like closeted on our side and you live in a community that like just doesn't accept you which is untrue from the like context right? that's why that like example yeah great but doesn't apply in this round then they say oh you can be a buddhist monk that's something you can never do on our side like there's so much satisfaction and stuff right look i can count the number of people who did that so there's no likelihood analysis from their side you can't buy that it's at best example based but we give you structural analysis for why you can't probably do all the things you want, which is to say the demands of your job are so severe because you're performing at a high level. There are so many expectations upon you, which is why your ability to do all the other things that they say is severely limited. Look, the way up on this is simple. Oh, we made on three, three metrics. The first one we went on is a probability metric on happiness, which is to say, 
the framing we give you in the first fucking 10 seconds of PM is that any marginal increases in happiness always tend to converge like something that they never respond to, which is to say, look, insofar as they don't guarantee you happiness, yes, you can throw money off a yacht, but by their own analysis, that means that rich people can just possibly never be depressed, which we know is statistically untrue. So I'm unsure why they get access to happiness there. Insofar as you don't do, we tell you why your ability to set expectations more realistically exists on our side, which is why lesser money also means that you get more happiness on our side. But the second thing I want you to note is the intensity of harm, which is to say, look, on their side, sure, you can like you can throw money off a yard, but obviously you get more hate speech for it. On our side, you're shielded from all those sorts of things. On their side, if you can't be happy after throwing money off a yard, who do you tell that to, right? You go to the public and you're like, guys, I'm not happy. They're like, you fucking stupid idiot. You have so much money. Why are you not happy, right? On our side, you have the greater ability to confide in individuals about the fact that you're not happy. So obviously, insofar as happiness is uncertain, we make life better for this individual. The third thing I want to note is the short circuiting mechanism of weighing, which is to say, insofar as it is true that you're going to be that privileged dick who throws money off a yard, you possibly can't be the same person who's going to like give money to charity because your public figure, like your public P PR figure can be one or the other. People don't accept money from like privileged individuals, which is why if all their benefits of like material wealth are true, all their benefits about like accessing like uh, greater charities and more fulfillment there are literally undercut. It can only be one or the other. You can choose which one you want. But the idea of being part of something larger also doesn't win them this round because like what is the comparative really you get insurance on our side you get premium insurance on their side like i don't understand why your family was asking for premium insurance to begin with right but second thing like we already call this out in third like we tell you why you can't end oppression by your money you possibly don't have fuck ton of money to end oppression around the world so you're likely to feel unsatisfied but really crucially your ability to end oppression or just feel like you're contributing is contingent on how you feel insofar as you get so much hate from within your community for structural reasons they never respond to ever you probably don't feel satisfied with the work that they do. We tell you you're shielded from oppression. You feel more happy with the people around you, all of which are asymmetric benefits we get only on our side. Proud to be on Gov. And with that, we close off the semis in a virtual cross the house. So everyone here.